Hello, everybody, and welcome back to ND3. We have a panel for you here today with, we've got some great guests. We've got Arden, we've got John Thayer, and AV, a.k.a. Mammon Machine. So I'm going to go ahead and bring them into the panel. Give me just a minute. Uh, here we go. I'll bring in Arden first. Hello, Arden. Thank you for joining us today. Hi. Hi. Could you give us a, a brief... Uh, introduction to yourself, and then I'll bring in the next person. Yep, um, I'm Arden. Uh, I make visual novels and dating sims. I made Kindness Coins last year for the Pulse Pounding Heart Stopping Jam. And right now I'm working on Date or Die, which is a visual novel that will be released in 2015. Ooh, exciting. Okay, looks like <laughs> Mammon Machine has, has come on their own volition. So and go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi there, my name is AVB. Um, I'm a game critic. I work on a little thing called Zeal on Patreon, which is does a lot of weird criticism of old games that maybe you didn't play, but are way better than any of the games that are coming out right now. Um, and I have a Twitter account, I guess. That's probably what I'm most known for. And talking about anime garbage. All right, and then uh, third up, we've got John Thayer. So go ahead and uh, introduce, yourself, introduce yourself, John, and then we will be off to the races. Cool. Um, uh, my name is John Thayer. I make games, and I write some criticism for a few friends' websites and on my blog. Uh, I made a platformer called Fugitive, and I just made a game called um, John and Anna are having a dance party, and it's pretty fun, I guess. <laughs> So, yeah. Uh, oh, wait. I typed that in the wrong place. Just a second. <laughs> uh, all right. Technical issues. Anyway, uh, here we are. It, the uh, topic of the panel today is creating effective drama in games. And I'll tell the audience that I was given this very serious description of <laughs> the topic of the panel. And it is, quote, two game designers and a critic talk about feels and cry about it. So there you, there you have it. Uh, I'm going to turn the time over to them, and we will go until 8 o'clock, or t until 9 o'clock, one hour from now, at which point we will have a special musical performance for you, which will close out our night for tonight. Thanks, everybody, Ooh, cool. for being here, and I hope that in you, you enjoy the discussion. Have at it. Wee. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have prepared... A series of questions that I will be asking the panelists. I'm AV, by the way, just to maintain that. Um, <laughs> so the first thing that I thought I would say is give us a little bit of time to say, like, okay, what does effective drama in games mean to you, the person who I will be asking this question? Because I think there are probably a whole lot of answers to this question. There's probably not just one way to make effective drama. Um, so, starting with Arden. Arden, what do hey. you think makes effective drama in the video games? Well, gosh, what a great question. Uh, I... Why, thank you. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, because I, I make, you know, dating sim type stuff, which is obviously very character centric. Um, so, for me, a lot of effective drama means that I just care a lot about the people involved like the characters involved in the game and whatever is happening and like it doesn't need to be like a huge uh like we're making a powerful statement type thing with me uh but it, i just have to be invested in whatever's going on um <laughs> and that can even just be something as small as like a cute love story or i mean if you can get me invested in like a big we're gonna save the world and make political statements while we do it, like, sort of thing, then that works too, but, you know, just make me care, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, that is a fantastic <laughs> answer. I love yeah, definitely. caring about things. I love to care. <laughs> it's very hard for me not to care. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good thing, though. And <laughs> when I don't care about things, I tend to turn off the video game that I am playing. So, John, why don't you tell me what effective drama means to you in the video games. Okay. Um, well, I'd probably say that it means 
design for in some way i'd say it means designing a game with like a singular purpose in mind of like what kind of story the game is trying to be so like i would say something like solar striker on the game boy which is this dinky little shmup where you're just the guy shooting down aliens and trying to get to the center of this planet and beat up the mother brain but i think it's really effective because it has like this cool thing where the setting changes from outer space to the sky to the city to inside the city and you're into the core and the music gets rougher and weirder as it progresses and the bosses are getting bigger and it's kind of all built around creating this fantasy of like the lone gunman going to the world and it's all done in this Game Boy game and so I feel like that just it works really well for me and in some way I feel like that is effective in the similar way of something like Mega Man 2 is effective and then it goes all the way up to games like Silent Hill 2 which are designed just really singularly in the same way or Dysphoria stuff like that cool no I I like both of your answers a whole lot and I will say well what do you think about what makes effective dramas AV well I'm glad you asked (laughs) Um, (laughs) what I um I think that those are actually both fantastic answers. I mean, um, one of the things that I've been finding the more and more that I write about games is that there are many, many different ways to create effective drama. Um, And one of the things that I've started to focus on the most um, are the ways in which video games specifically seem to be just especially good at creating drama. The things that just makes more sense for them to do in them. Like, I think you can do pretty much anything you want to in video games, but there are some things that they do just slightly better than other mediums. And those are the things that I tend to like to focus on. And I think actually the two of you both separately brought up the two things that I think are the most interesting about video games. Um, What with Arden bringing up characters, I think video games tend to have um, because they can be so non-linear, video games are really good at creating at least the illusion of this organic um, interaction between different people. Um, You can just sort of throw a couple of people in a room and see them hang out with each other, like in the Fire Emblems and the Dating Sims and stuff like that. Um, And because they're so good at character, um, they don't need to be so great at plot. And some of those games have really bad or really... um, facile or uninteresting plots but they don't really need to have good ones because rather than the plot needing to be a vehicle for the characters it can just be this kind of like threadbare thing and you can watch all these people do stuff and grow attached to them and find value in that um and i'm gonna go keep going and and john (laughs) um what you brought up is the other thing that i really totally like which is the sort of atmospheric way of storytelling like the metroid and the dark souls and stuff like that that has very little weird words maybe not even any characters at all Mm -hmm. but it's got a lot of visual and sound design that creates a sense of what's happening you might not like be able to say oh like this guy did this thing and went to the place but you can you get this feeling um going from one area to another of of those games that like i'm moving from one place to another it's it's different, it's changing, things are happening, and this um, this place feels um, different than this other place. Um, and I think sometimes, as, as somebody who is a writer, I worry that I put way too much emphasis on writing, and I like those games um, with a lot of writing in them a whole lot, but I also like games that sort of challenge me to think about how drama can be done in other ways. So yeah, that's my intro. That was a good answer. Totally. I thank you. <laughs> you two are so sweet. We all just love each other on this panel. It's just like a good time for everyone. It a lot is. of happy feelings. Um yeah. so what do y'all what do y'all think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that characters can absolutely save um a subpar uh plot or like story type thing um for sure like i one of my 
favorite games is Dragon Age Origins, and like that game, like that game's plot is like pretty standard. Like it's pretty standard generic fantasy stuff. Like, look, here's a bad guy. You have to unite the elves and the dwarves and go kick his ass. And I'm like, well, okay. Like, I don't really care why about not? that. Like, why? Okay, sure. But what I'm really here for is like, I'm here for Alistair. You know, like I am here for like kissing all the different party members just because like a lot of yeah. uh, a lot of those companions are just so well written like Alistair and Morgan especially and like they kind of are what makes me love that game so much like I've I've replayed that game probably like 10 times at this point um just because I love like being part of that world and interacting with those characters and stuff it's just really great like they they definitely are the reason that I love that so much. Totally. John, cool. do you like I know you haven't talked about characters yet, but how, mm-hmm. how do you feel about all this character stuff that we're saying? <laughs> well, um well I was thinking of like what you said about games that like don't even have really any text any characters or plot, and I was mostly just thinking about our type, <laughs> which is like no characters or really a very basic plot and that's like basically all just texture at that point and i feel like that is a really ef- that really effectively conveys a certain mood and ends up conveying a certain story in a cool way as for like characters that work really well i think someone in the chat said the walking dead which is which is a great example but i um well i really love chrono trigger which i think we, um you do as well. You can see on the username panel, and so much of that <laughs> is just having the characters that are each kind of have their own purpose in the story, but also are just really comp- have their own little compelling mini stories in their own right. And I think that can just add so much to a game or a story if you just have some people you care about. Like even like there's this one game called Another World that came out on DOS in the early '90s. Yeah, and there's this, it is, it, then there's this little um, guy, uh, guy you rescue from these awful, this awful police state thing, and you, he, you help free him, and then he helps you, and then you get split up, and then he comes back later on in the game, and eventually he just saves you well, at the very end, and you're desperately crawling and he's punching the guy and he almost dies but then saves himself and all completely no dialogue but it it just in like these little broad strokes is making you care about these people and it ends up creating a really effective little set piece at the very end where you're caring where you care about your character you care about this character and you're afraid because you're in danger because everything kills you in that game. <laughs> and <laughs> that is for then, sure. Then it just yeah. makes the and then the ending is just really sweet. And that's all because they introduce this one character that you care about and kind of built it through to had that thorough line running through to the end. So okay, oh yeah. And so that kind of ties into the whole thing with like texture. We're like Mega Man 2 is this very simple simple story an effective story. Uh, But then compare that with like Mega Man X, where you have the whole little, the two sequences with Vile and Zero, and just think about how much that adds to the game, just to have that little thorough line running through. Yeah, I'm I'm really glad that you brought up uh, the Another World, Out of This World uh game, because it's one of the, it's a really good example that I think combines both of the things that we've been talking about, which is, the sort of like atmospheric minimalism, but also character development, because it's got that other character. It's like, it's not like you're necessarily just a cipher kind of exploring a world, which is honestly kind of how like the Metroid games are. Oh, but totally. You have, there's a person there, and then he's interacting with this other person, and you're, you're friends with your alien buddy. Um, you know, I think one thing I'm going to ask us an impromptu question um because we've Uh-oh. been talking about caring a lot and i was wondering like maybe we should talk a little bit about like why do we care about these games um or like what's what's making us care in these instances 
Because I can think of a heck of a lot of games where I don't give a shit about it. <laughs> Wait, can I, am I allowed to say that? I think um, so. <laughs> am I supposed to keep it PG? All right. Sorry. PG so would be nice. Yeah. So, oh, okay. Anyways. Really? Okay. Good then job. I apologize for everything. <laughs> um, so uh, what I will say then is what, like, there are games that I've not cared about anybody or anything that is happening in it. Um, what maybe we should start out with what makes you don't care and then move on to what makes us care oh that's hard mm. yeah yeah because it's it's hard to actually like pinpointing down like oh yes this is the quality that makes me oh actually you know what okay so i have been trying for years to play the witcher because <laughs> all my friends love the witcher and everyone's so excited about the witcher 3 and i'm like well okay like there must be something here and i love rpgs and you know all this nonsense like that sounds great um so like i keep trying to play it and i just keep falling asleep like last night i was literally drifting off at my computer while i was trying to play this game and i was like like i do not care about that protagonist even a little bit like he monotones at me all the time like and he looks so cool as the thing i really like his design like he has these weird cat eyes and he's got he's like a white-haired anime boy which is you know like my thing uh and yeah and, and like he's got all these grizzly looking scars and stuff and he's like the most boring dude i've ever seen it, and like he just drones at me and no one explains what's happening for so long in that game and I am just like, come on, man. Like, I want I want to love you right now. Like, I want to hold you in my arms and, like, you keep pushing me away. <laughs> <laughs> like, why do you push me away, Geralt? Like, don't do this. Uh, he's just too much of, like, a cipher, I guess. Um, it seems like he really does not mm, have mm. a personality of his own. I mean, so far, anyway. Again, like, I've only played parts of the first game um so he could get better but it seems like he's right now he's just has literally no personality like at all other than i guess i fight monsters and look kind of pretty which is you know does he have voice acting does he like talk oh yeah oh yeah he talks he talks in a monotone (laughs) oh yeah, that's the weird thing is when they have like these half cipher characters. Like you can have your Samuses and your Mega Mans and your Dragon Crest people and your Chronos, but then you have people who are kind of like halfway in between the blank cipher character and the actual developed character. And I ne- almost feel like that never really works. Like you kind of have to go with one or the other. It's definitely really hard to make that work. Like in the mm-hmm. in the game that I'm writing now, um, it's you can like choose certain things that the protagonist says um and and stuff but you can't pick like every single one of her responses because i don't want to write that much dialogue um, <laughs> and no that's really true it's oh god <laughs> um so it's like really challenging to try to make her like a consistent well-defined character while also giving players like the room to like choose some of her responses and stuff it's definitely a really hard thing um Mm -hmm. to do from the writing standpoint Ugh, god yeah i think that (laughs) excuse me um i think that that's a problem that i see in a whole lot of games sometimes they there's an idea that you're supposed to have a cipher character in order to give the audience kind of like here's a window into this fantasy world here's somebody who you can be kind of like whether it's like literally you're an avatar and you're like creating a character or if it's just like oh here's just a very generic person to which you can you know who relate to right who you can relate to like um when i wrote about the fire emblems a little bit ago i wrote a about Michael Moorcock's advice for how do you write a fantasy novel in three days. Um, and, and you can do it by using a lot of these stark, uh, these stock archetypes. And he always like puts in some sort of like clown character who's there to be relatable when the protagonist, who's like this often this like weird elf dude, a lot like um, G money or whoever the person in the, um, 
uh, the Witcher is. Um, <laughs> Too funny. Yeah, that's his name. Yeah, Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, um, like, who is very much based on that sort of pulp fantasy tradition. So they're, they're continuing a lot of those same tropes. Um, and they end up being really unsuccessful, I think, a lot of times. And maybe we can talk a little bit about why we think that is. Yeah, man. I mean, right. <laughs> yeah, you well, go, do you think, Sorry, John? I've been talking. Okay, cool. Um, well, it sounds like with that kind of thing, if you're taking, trying to take like a template and just kind of work up from there, I feel like you're almost always going to create something kind of soulless and uninteresting, just because it's so reductive. It's like when people take the hero's journey and try to reverse engineer a story from that instead of like thinking about the story they want to tell and then maybe going and then reducing it later on to the hero's journey. Cause that's, it's backwards. The hero's journey is like this reductive model built up, built off of taking stories apart. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but people will take these kind of those same kind of templates and try to build stories off of them. So I feel like the best thing you can do is just have a point or something you want to say or capture some kind of feeling or thought and then building the story off of that instead of just going, well, I want to write a story about elves and I don't think you're going to make anything interesting about that instead of like, I want to write a story about greed and <laughs> that you can do more interesting stuff You can stuff have greedy that. elves. That's true. <laughs> but, but you want to go, but instead of going, I want to make a story about elves, ooh, maybe they're greedy, you want to go, I want to make a story about greed, maybe elves. <laughs> No, I think that that is, that is very true. Um, and one thing that um, Michael Moorcock's really interesting advice about writing a fantasy novel in three days, which I suggest you check out, it's on my, there's a link to it on my website. Um, oh, cool. And um, is that it is just a framework. Like, it won't let you write a brilliant story. Like, it will let you write this kind of, like, plot boiler, really page turny sort of novel um, in three days. That is what the result will be. The actual thing will probably be soulless and not very good if you don't have any interesting ideas that you're putting into that framework. Like, it is basically just a vehicle for you to insert whatever you want to put in. Like, when people make a video game of X genre or whatever, it's a really interesting framework, like the RPG or what, you know, or what have you. Um, and that can, if it's done right, you can have a really good system for pacing a story. Um, but unless you put in anything, a cool thing that you thought or maybe has to do with a real person's real life, you're probably not going to have anything interesting in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the question of, are you thinking this is the story I want to tell and an RPG framework would be the most effective way to tell that story. Are you thinking, I want to make an RPG, I need elves. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta yeah. have surly dwarves. <laughs> uh, exactly. It's not, it's not an RPG without dwarves who drink a lot and swear mm -hmm. and cuss. <laughs> I'm so over dwarves and elves. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, and actually, that's a pretty good segue into the, the question that I had prepared us earlier, which is... Do games with good drama in them need to be good games? Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So, do games actually yeah. need to be? Do games actually need to be mechanically interesting? Um, right. I know this. This is a question we ask a lot. We like say, "Oh, that that game over there, that walking simulator, um, <laughs> gone home. Um, it's not much of a game, is it?" Like, so, so how much do we actually care about that? Um, and if we don't care about it, why are we making them in the video games? Yeah, go for it, Arden. Um, man, I get so mad when people are like, oh, well, it's good, but it's not really a game. Or like, because whatever, who cares? Like, just let, let it happen. Um, but no, I don't really... I mean, maybe I'm biased because I make visual novels where the mechanics consist of click and read things. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think that like to be considered like you know like to have good drama they should also have good mechanics like um one of my one of my favorite games like for 
as far as like drama and stuff goes is uh this game by uh this russian studio called ice pick lodge called pathologic um and that game is like it is a miserable game to play um but it's also one of my favorite games but it is like it's broken and it, you you know there's <sighs> There's so many, like, problems with it, and it's a genuinely stressful and, like, oppressive experience, like, playing that game. Um, And I think, like, in this case, it actually kind of works in favor of, like, the atmosphere, because Pathologic is about um, this, like, disease outbreak, like, breaking out in this small, like, Eastern European village. Like, if it was going to have a literal title, it would just be Eastern European Suffering Simulator. Um, And it's... uh, 2014. (laughs) Yep. Um... (laughs) <laughs> but it's it's like just things just keep getting worse and you don't have enough time in the day to like give medicine to everyone or to like get food for yourself or like whatever and it's just like by the end of that game i was pretty sure i was gonna start having like real panic attacks because like oh god it was so not fun um and then you know i finished all three like character paths in it and i was like cool that was amazing i'm never gonna play that again and one of the reasons why it's really hard to find like good let's plays or anything of pathologic is because people who have actually know about it and have played it literally don't want to play it ever again uh, <laughs> because it's so not fun to play. Wow. Um, this sounds and a lot so of, cool. Uh, yeah. A lot of ice pick lodges um, stuff has this, like the void as uh, one of their games that, um, is it has like a strategy management sort of side to it and that is also a nightmare um but i still think that they're amazing and they're really cool things that people can learn from but you know they're they are not good games mechanically but i don't think they need to be in this case i think it almost like adds to it it like helps with that atmosphere of like you know fear and stress <laughs> That actually sounds identical to my reaction to um, a Problematic. Did either of you play that? Liz oh, Ryerson's yeah. game? I... Yeah. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah, the that was probably no. That was probably my favorite game from last year. And it took me like four or five, like two or three times. I picked it, put it, I sat down. I was like, all right, time to play Problematic. I'm going to do it this time. And then I stop and then so like over six months (laughs) over like six months i tried doing that over and over again until finally i just like i'm gonna do it i'm gonna do it and then i'm like two in the morning and just like (laughs) oh i keep playing and i keep playing and it's like five hours long and i loved it and it's this it has all these it's no real it's like what we were saying like no real characters and a lot just this really heavy attention to atmosphere to the aesthetics and the music and how it all works together and it's all these really interesting kind of thematic ideas about abuse and gender and trauma and it's really unpleasant to play because like all the puzzles it's it's deliberately designed so that you like have like where the, where the rules of the puzzle or puzzles are obscured where you don't know what it is you're supposed to do and there and then it breaks its own rules like it introduces this thing as an enemy and then but later on you have to just ride on top of it to get to the end of the stage that's like at the beginning of the game yeah and mm-hmm. it's really hard and i had to and there's of course there's nobody like who did a walkthrough of it online at least at the time so i just had to bang my head against it for so long and like like you said it i feel like the experience of playing that game really, really matches the thematic statements it evokes with feeling like being forced, like with that rule I said about the Hmm. I think we just lost. The, what just happened here? Uh, hold on. Sorry. We can we back up about thirty seconds. We had some kind of issue. I believe it's resolved oh, now. Oh, whoops. Okay, cool. Um, I was just talking about problematic. I said that it's really, really hard, <laughs> and that the puzzles are puzzles. Kind of, 
obscure their own rules or to the point where you don't really know what you're exactly as you're supposed to do in each level. And there's this one enemy at the beginning of the game who you're immediately taught, um, don't touch this thing, it kills you. And then three screens later, you have to uh, ride that enemy to the top of the screen in order to progress, and you have to keep doing that. And it makes this awful, like, shaking limb sound, and it's the worst. And I feel like that's a... It's not a mechanical idea that is, like I said, like a Super Mario Brothers game, but it's a thematic idea about being forced to rely on these things that cause you pain. And then later on, those are kind of associated with gender and trauma. And if you th if you engage with the game on that kind of symbolic level, then you can really get a whole lot out of it. And the trials of actually trying to play it are a big part of that. Yeah, yeah. Like it's not it's not fun to play, but it doesn't need to be fun to play, mm -hmm. Link, at all. And, and the way parts of it that aren't fun are not fun for a specific reason. But yeah. In a way, I feel like the game's kind of perfect. <laughs> And it's very, like, compelling in that, like, when I played Problematic, I was like, I, I want to figure out these puzzles, even though they're, they're really hard and sometimes um, intentionally kind of, like, difficult, not just challenging. But it's done in such a way that you do feel compelled to come back to it, even if sometimes you put down the entire game and go and do something else. Yeah. Like, it's mm -hmm. got a lot of it's got a lot of persistence emotionally yeah. Yeah, it's, it. it's a taxing game which is kind of weird to think about that something can just be draining yeah i know that um like yeah just thinking about more games with that are you know really not great mechanically but still like made a big drama impact i feel like you can't like talk about this subject without mentioning uh near at all uh just yeah, mm, it's, yeah, because yeah. Nier is um, like one of my favorite stories in games. But like, wow, I really do not enjoy playing Nier. Um, <laughs> like it's, you know, combat is really clunky and you have to do so much pointless grinding for stuff. And it's not fun, but I love that story so much. And like, I mean, it, oh, it's very important to me. Uh and you know, like all with the stuff that after you've completed playing it like three times and wasted like a hundred hours of your life, and they're like, "Hey, do you want to delete all your save data?" And I'm just like, "What? Like, this isn't fun anymore. Why are you doing this to me?" But it was, uh, it was just like so well told. Um, I don't know. It was near is a great game, but it is not a fun game <laughs> at all. Yeah, it's... Echo the Dolphin is like that too. It's kind of, it really is one of my favorite games, and I kind of unironically love the Welcome to the Machine level. And oh God! Yeah, I know. I played it for like six hours, and I kind of <laughs> I kind of love it now, even though it's awful. I kind of like... want to make a game in that style. Actually, it's like Stockholm Syndrome, but for video games. That's exactly <laughs> what other people have told me. They use that exact comparison. I don't know what it is. Oh, there's Merit. Yep. Yeah. Echo the Dolphin is really miserable to play in a lot of points, but it just has that amazing sense of tone and just ambiance and just it gets so terrifying, especially with the machine. So, yeah, yeah God, <laughs> it's just so tonally effective that I just kind of love it. I love that sort of I really like the 90s cyber hunt body horror aesthetic, mm -hmm. bringing it back. <laughs> um, one thing, so one thing that I wanted to talk about was just like this is slightly a tangent from um, the games that are really kind of like difficult or challenging or abrasive even. Um, but the games that I kind of like, or at least one genre of game that I like that I don't think is a very good game or like very mechanically interesting is most RPGs. Um, and there's an interesting thing that. Um, I saw once in an article by the Tim Rogers about Dragon Quest and how like the original Dragon Quest is kind of like, um, which is like the Ur JRPG. It's like kind of where everything gets its descent from. And it was made as a game that anyone could play. 
that anyone could do really well at because all that is required is that you kill monsters and get experience and gold. So it's like an investment of time rather than, say, skill. Yeah, um, and exactly what article you're talking about, too. Yeah, it's the, it's the Dragon Quest V review, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And that, like, if we were saying that now, and Tim Rogers brings this up, but it's like, that's like pure social gaming mechanics, and you would see those done really cynically at the moment. But with Dragon Quest, they're kind of like, oh, if you're going to spend this long in this place, maybe there should be some people in it who you can talk to. And they sort of hit on like kind of like creating a world and using the idea of experience points and grinding and all that stuff to let anyone move through this experience at a particular pacing that's like really mathematically controlled, if you think about it. Um, and... I think that's a really cool idea. I like the idea that the game is maybe not challenging, but always has this feeling of being challenging, of like overcoming adversity and that it's populated with people. And that um, I sort of started thinking about how, hey, maybe like I don't necessarily need all of my RPGs um, to be super excellent at games as long as they're really good at pacing me through something. Like, if you can, if you're, like, maybe not the most fun thing in the world to play, but you're doing a really good job of making me feel like I'm not wasting my time and that I keep on getting to meet new people and have cool experiences, then maybe I don't care if it's, like, super compelling to do, like, to cast Fire 3 on the goblin over there. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like your Pokemon article. I brought that up with a friend a few times who's complaining yeah. a lot about Pokemon. That's true. I think Pokemon it's I think it's absolutely stuff. true. I, I mean, it that, rules. <laughs> totally rules. Yeah, it's like I feel like there's this elevation of something like that kind of game design over uh, over like Twitch games, which are really inaccessible to a whole lot of people. So, hello. It also feels kind of exclusive in a weird way. Yeah, it's like with Pokemon. I know that there's like probably some cool high level stuff you can do but like i don't yeah I don't care the about the that. competitive pokemon scene is ridiculous <laughs> i mean like i just want to hang out with like my little gooey dragon and my frog ninja yeah and, like i want to feed them like macaroons and watch them be <laughs> real cute like that's that and then like i get to dress up and wear cute clothes and fly around on my birds like that is what i really enjoy doing and i don't and I actually found myself really not caring that it was like that the battle system was really trivially useless um, because the world that it was creating. I hadn't quite felt that way about like the last couple of Pokemon, um, but this one in particular seemed to have put so much effort into bringing that world to life, all, everything around the battling, that I didn't mind that the battling was like exactly the same. I know they sucked me back in. Every every new game, they're all, they're always like, I'm always like, oh, I think I'm done with Pokemon. You know, like I I this combat and like you know the whole mechanical thing is just the same thing, and I am uh, like I'm kind of burned out on it. And then they're like, but look, now you can make your Pokemon wear cute hats, and I'm like, oh my god, I need it right now. <laughs> like, yeah. Day one. It's like it's so funny how like Pokemon is kind of like relentlessly. Not like there's no real, there's very little character. The plot is kind of gone. It's just like nothing in, but you and these incredibly cute little creatures. And that's actually so kind of cute. enough. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. They're like, I, they put so much time and energy into making them cute. Like, that's, it that's where it's at. <laughs> Dragon Knight. I love that the most one of the most powerful Pokemon in the original game is just this adorable dragon that's like out of Arnie. It's perfect. <laughs> yeah, Dragonite but, is so goofy looking. I love it. I know. And I will say that I feel like the first couple Pokemon games actually deserve a lot of credit for um, kind of how they structure their stories. And then the later ones, they get really kind of tedious and uninteresting. Like the final boss of the latest Pokemon game is this random character from... A million gameplay hours ago 
and I just didn't care at all on a narrative level about that last boss fight. But then, like, the first game, you have that whole thorough line with Gary. You have the whole thorough line with um, the gyms and growing up to become join the Pokemon League. And then the whole thorough line with Team Rocket. And they all kind of interweave in these cool ways, like where, t- where the head of Team Rocket is the eighth team leader. And you see Gary in the Rocket hideout. And then after you beat the Elite Four and you think, well, that's it. I beat the Elite Four. It turns out that Gary's the champion. And I realize I'm saying Gary instead of Blue, but whatever he's gary <laughs> exactly yeah, so I, I feel like i feel like the first pokemon game is kind of really effective in that sense just like what we, about dramatically even with its very simple story versus something like the newest pokemon where again the last boss fight is random ass cynthia lady from one scene early on yeah and it's like Sometimes games don't need to do things. And I think, how about, it, since, yeah, I'll just ask this question. Who knows how long we'll spend it. But um, why don't we go around and say, like, what would you like games to stop doing? Like, to just stop. Ooh. That's clearly not working, and you keep on seeing in narratives, and that you think that they should no longer do ever again. And that maybe they should do something else. Oh man, oh man, I feel like I have, I feel like I have too many things. Um, <laughs> That's the opposite. Right? I'm having, a lot. I'm having trouble. Um, Arden, you okay. can go first, then. Oh jeez. Um, I would really like to stop seeing uh like good versus evil morality systems in games uh and i know that oh, probably sounds yeah, weird be- i mean it probably sounds oh. weird because i i love bioware games and i'm a huge bioware fan um but like stop please um it, like it, it works for star wars because that's you know that universe's deal like their, that's their whole thing um but then like like I, I think it was mass effect 2 that i was playing um for the first time and I just, I don't play, like, a Paragon or a Renegade Shepherd. I just play, like, whatever seems appropriate to me at the time. But then you kind of get screwed over if you're not, like, 100% yeah. one way or the other. Like, the game actively punishes you for, like, being a character that has some variety in the way that, like, she acts and stuff. And that just, like, really threw me off. And, I mean, part of the reason I liked Origins so much was because they did not have any morality systems like that. It was, there wasn't even, like, a little icon next to dialogue choices that is, you know, there's no, like, angry fist icon next to, like, the mean response or whatever. It's <laughs> it's just they're, they're trusting that the player is able to, you know, make those decisions and, you know, read into that and, like, choose the option that they like the most or that fits with the character they're trying to roleplay as the most. Um, and I loved that. And then in two they kind of threw that all out the window um and was just like what about mass effect but with dragons uh and it brought back that effing dialogue wheel with uh Ugh. you know the different like icons that are like in case you didn't know this is the nice people option and like i just wish that they would stop because there's no need like just let me you know, I, I like Telltale system better of just let me decide what my decisions mean. Like, you don't need to tell me, like, that this was a bad thing. Like, I you just leave that up to me and stuff. And, like, some of my most interesting conversations with friends came from when we were talking about, like, things in The Walking Dead. And we'd get into, like, really heated matches, like, you know, why would you do that to that person in that game? Like, how could you, th- how, you monster? Nice. And then, I've never had a conversation like that about anything in the Mass Effect series because it's just, oh, were you a Paragon or a Renegade? I was Paragon. Oh, okay. And that's that's it. Like that's so where boring. That mm-hmm. ends. It's just really boring and I just want people to stop. Just stop. Mm-hmm. That so, yeah, is that's a really good one. Yeah, that's Definitely. my thing. Yeah, Chrono Cross <laughs> is another game that's pretty good about presenting you with choices. I mean, that's obviously a very weird, bizarre game in a lot of ways, but that's one thing I think it kind of hones in on really well is presenting you with these choices like you can save your friend or kill a f- and kill a forest <laughs> what do you do screw so trees i feel like yeah yeah exactly. <laughs> oh and now all the fairies are being murdered because you killed the forest was it worth it so yeah <laughs> i feel like that's cool 
Um, I think that's a great answer. Like I remember the first Bioshock game. It's just so obviously just tacky and uninteresting. It's like, are you, do yeah. you want to kill the little girl or I not? know, it's like, hey. Oh, moral <laughs> dilemma. And the, the the funny thing about um, that dilemma in Bioshock, the, the harvest or save thing, is that you actually, like, by the end of the game, you get pretty much the same amount of atoms exactly. either way. <laughs> like, it's not actually... I mean, if you want to make that... The players have that decision, you need to make things considerably more difficult for them. Um, and they just, like, didn't. It was like, <laughs> okay, you're gonna... I'm still gonna get the same amount of atom, and you're also gonna throw, like, gene tonics at me. Like, this isn't... Like, okay... Well, uh, like in the first Legacy of Cain game, and the first the first Legacy of Cain game is cool about that because it paints you like this vampire, where you have to like kill people if you want to survive, if you want to drink blood. But there's also other ways to get blood that are away from the humans, which is so that's something you can do. But if you try to do the Paragon way, then the game really punishes you for it, and I think makes it basically impossible. So it kind of with the situation it kind of forces you into that or into that character's position which i think is just way more interesting than do you want to kill the little girl or not and reap the same rewards either way yeah well it's this it's this bizarre sort of double thing where they're like we want you to have like a compelling moral choice but they don't actually really believe it they set up these things and they're like well there's a good one and an evil one and clearly the evil one must be punished because we're operating according to this kind of like really strict cultural construction of what we think these particular values are. And like the ones that are violated are bad and the ones that uphold it are good. Um, and rather than be like, hey, you can pick two choices. They're both interesting and they will lead you to both to interesting things. They kind of want to like, if not like punish you game wise, just kind of like yell at you for <laughs> picking the evil option. Like I played so oh, I was, yeah. like it was infamous I, that I played and that game, dang, not so great. But like one of the things that kept on happening is that they kept on like being evil just meant I was a jerk. And they just kept on saying, like, you got <laughs> you're being such a jerk. And I'm like, I like I know is this really like <laughs> nobody likes me, everything sucks. Um, none of these choices even like benefit me in any way at all. Um, <laughs> and I'm just like a jerk with red lightning and that's what I get. And I feel like that sort of is kind of like narratively pun narrative punishment almost. It's like, we're going to give you something that's not very interesting. That, that is because we feel like we can't reward you for doing what we consider is evil. Yeah, I, I just feel like that's so much like taking the easy way out as far as like bad endings or like evil paths go in like games with branching stories like that. Like, cause it's entirely possible to make like bad endings or um, like bad, like evil roots that are like just as interesting as, um, you know the main good one or whatever uh like if you you know if you absolutely need to have like a good or evil like clash um but like it's just because it's just so easy to write it and be like you know make it boring and no one will talk to you and everyone hates you and whatever uh like it, it's just not it's not like challenging to write that like at all yeah well yeah when the, when the divide is transparent like that transparent like that i've never I don't think I've ever seen an, an example of that where I thought it was interesting. John, did you manage to think of something that you want games to just stop? To just stop doing? Oh, God, the morality system one was so good. Um, <laughs> I feel like in a lot of sense, people are bringing up a lot of great examples of things that are almost always, like, bad. And, like, I remember this thing about the datification of games, which is obviously... <laughs> kind of weird and gross in a lot of ways but then you have games like the walking dead and i really
difficult. Fool me once. Apparently, I just got booted back out to do not disturb. Oh. Sorry, oh. folks. All right, all right. I, I, I was eating a sandwich in the other room and I didn't see it. I'm sorry. It's all right. No oh, problem at all. It just cut out. All Are right. we back? Yep. Yep, we're back. So yeah, I think all, all I was saying was that Chrono Trigger is yeah, it's the hero's journey, I guess, but it's that's not really the point. The point is that it is this super cool existential story with metaphors and symbols and tension and drama and characters. And that's why you don't want to build up from the hero's journey. You want to just tell the story you want to tell, and then people can reduce it to that afterwards. Like the mother games all fa all basically are that, but they weren't. The, he didn't go, oh, I, I'm going to make a story about the hero's journey. I better fill in the call and the return and fill in these checkboxes. I, I think Film Crit Hulk had a big panel, a build, big column about this. So I'm just thinking about that. This is all in my head. So that's another thing that is awful so much of the time and then can be done really well no it's so, totally important to remember that there aren't like hard and fast rules even with the stuff that we're complaining about it's like these are things that get wrong i think because people decide to do them without thinking about why they're doing them but if you do them on purpose and you're thinking about having a good reason for that sometimes that's really good yeah so i i I love a whole lot of mobile games. Um, there's a lot of really tacky uses of in-app purchases and stuff like that, although that doesn't have as much to do with, like, drama. <laughs> All right, well, yeah. there's a lot of really terrible, terrible... Um, I guess it'd be nice if we started having some more... I, I, All right. AAA game designers should stop saying that women cost twice as much it would double the cost to make. That's stupid yeah. all the time. <laughs> okay, that, that's, that isn't an example of something that can be done to good effect. No, that is always wrong. The that idea is that... definitely a good one. Thank well, you. it's funny cool. because there, I, I hear a lot of like AAA like, games, people will be like, oh, uh, women are easier, or, like, are they harder to write for because they emote so much? And I'm just like, oh my what? god. Like, what year are we in? <laughs> and I, like, hey, how about you make, like, male protagonists that also have feelings and emotions? Like, that would be pretty cool, huh? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, like, I, I think I just almost never, I, I have a few people who, like, point me towards the AAA games that I, that I pretty much know I like, so I'll just play like one or two a year and have a great time and it's like wow this is so pretty i didn't know they made <laughs> games like this so like I, I played last of us and i'll probably play saints row 4 at some point and then i just didn't play any other triple a games from that year and i'm really happy well there you go sometimes so, sometimes that is a good option yeah <laughs> but I yeah say... i'm always open to like hearing people tell me hey you should go play saints row 4 really yeah you should okay sure <laughs> So the thing that I want games to just stop is that, wait, I, ha I can't swear. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, I, it really just, please never, never show me some, some old dude who's never appears in the game intoning some legend of blah, blah, blah. Oh my God. Over like some like. Flowery like animated images or some stuff like is... the uh... beginning of every single game that has a dragon in it. Hey, this is like... literally how The Witcher starts. I know, of course, it <laughs> of course it does. I've never played it, but but of you know it that does. it starts that way because there's dragons or something in it. If there are no mm. dragons in The Witcher, I don't care. There's basically <laughs> dragons in it, and like the thing is, is is that like that. Like, why do you even have these these cipher characters who are there to, like, ostensibly draw you into the story if you're going to just blah, blah, blah at me <laughs> for, like, 15 minutes? And it's, like, the thing is, is that I don't care about this stuff yet. I have no, absolutely no reason to be have any sort of investment in this fantasy world because I haven't seen the world. I don't know anybody in the world. There's nothing that's holding me to want to care about these, like, story details. Exactly. That, to be honest, I just really don't need to know those right away. Like, I can get to, to know what that stuff is way later on in your game. And yeah, it's so, I think it's... 
yeah, yeah. I, I definitely agree with you. I think it's important, like, you should give players a reason to care about, like, your main character, like, the person that you are first. Like, start small, and then, like, you can, like, spread out. Like, give them reasons to care about, like, the town that they start off in, or, like, you know, the friends around them, and then, like, expand to, like, the world itself, and then you can have your boring voiceovers and whatever. Like, but don't start with it, like, before you even pick up the controller. <laughs> like, No kidding. And, like, I hate, like, I'm going to say it, I'm going to bring up Final Fantasy VII, but the, <gasps> thing about, the thing is, is that that game starts off with, like, oh, this train's pulling in the station, and these people, they're going to do a thing, and you know that it's going to be trouble, and you figure out who these people are by the way that they interact with each other on the way to do the thing, and then you figure out, like, there's not this thing that says, like, Mako is the life energy of the planet. And <laughs> for thousands of years, people have blah, blah, blah. Like, and well, that's how yeah, like, Advent Children like, starts, history. isn't it? <laughs> oh, God. So, it probably is. How Advent it probably is. Oh, my starts. God. Yeah. Well, it does. Because it's like, that was a person who knew who to, how, what to make a story back then. And not so many of those people too much anymore. <laughs> um, uh-huh. That's a great, I think that's a great example. Yeah. 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 Say, like, yeah there's I lots absolutely about that agree. Game, but, mm. but they do that thing really good. I think, like, honestly, that's one of the most important things that you gotta do if you want me to keep playing your game. Yeah, for sure. Just like make me care immediately. That's again, that's one of the big problems we're having with The Witcher right now is that I have literally no reason to care about anyone so far. Like. Uh, Especially because I Geralt starts off like with amnesia, I think, um, cause he like doesn't know anything either. But like that's not helpful to me. Like I want yeah. Geralt to at least know something. Am- please because, stop like, amnesia. Every like character that I've like talked to so far has just like droned exposition at me for like ten minutes at a time. When I'm like, I was just asking where the bathroom is, or like, where do you know where oh, I can God, get a sandwich funny. around here? Like. And they're like, oh, well, sandwiches come from the land of wherever. And it's like, oh, God, dude, stop. <laughs> Please. <laughs> and- pacing. It's all back to pacing. Like- Absolutely. Yeah. It's like, don't well, front actually, load this all funny, on me. Actually, funny, because I feel like Final Fantasy VII is like one of the might be the only game I can think of that actually does amnesia really well because of the way it's paced through the story. And it's kind of almost like a Hitchcock movie, the way it has the Nibelheim sequence and then tells you what happened later on, reality. So, and it's not just this person is blank because they have amnesia, which is just so different. Yeah, um, yeah. Like, here's and he's actually a character, and there's like mm-hmm. he there's not an excuse for writing somebody with no personality because he has amnesia. Yeah, it's like I don't buy that. Oh, this well, person says six. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, you could say some. This person says Final Fantasy six does oh. the amnesia thing. Yeah, that's pretty well. And it, also yeah. because it introduces you to a bunch of characters who you can care about in the meantime. Like it introduces you to Locke and Edgar. Or so before you even find out about Tara, you have all these other people you can. Yeah, because like, yeah, exactly. Tara has all of this. Like, it also has an intro where like things are happening and these soldiers are invading uh-huh. the town and it starts like in media res. And like, mm-hmm. then... and it has the intoning thing, but it's only like a minute long and before it gets to like the actual good stuff so that just seems a lot better yeah and it, it isn't like that the one that's like over those like they're like they're all mode seven in it up and <laughs> do, 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 yeah do, do, do. and they're like yeah, exactly walking towards the the village like that's pretty like the the abstract graphics with people like the old dude in toning is the most worst part of it i promise yeah uh-huh yeah, because you're seeing the people while that stuff's happening. It's nice. Yeah, yeah, not just like landscapes. Like, uh-huh. It's like cool. So, so yeah, mm-hmm. the amnesia can apparently work. Um, yeah, yeah, I guess the I, I, mean, the I guess the one that absolutely never ever works is the developer <laughs> cost twice as much excuse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's very just flattering, like... but not true. Mm-hmm. Amnesia is just like any other plot device. You can either like do a good job with it or not do a good job yeah, with it. That thing is when people just get in there as like a crutch, basically, which is the same yeah. thing as the hero's journey. 
all mm -hmm. sorts of tropes and you just have to think about there's always good examples of those tropes and that's why they're tropes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well said well i think we can make the conclusion based on this that the worst game of all time is the witcher and <laughs> The best game is Pokemon. <laughs> everyone, everyone agreed with that in terms of effective drama. Yeah, Witcher, that's what we learned least today. effective. Pokemon most. The scale goes from Witcher to Pokemon. <laughs> let's let's also point out that in the second Pokemon game, you fight yourself from the previous game. Oh my god! And that's that right. blows that blew my your mind. Eye mind. That's I was like, like a, that's like mother baby. level shit. Oh, yeah, I was sorry. A baby sorry, 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 sorry. That, that freaked uh, me out when I was a kid. Like, I know. I like, and then it doesn't, he doesn't say anything either. He's just dot, dot, dot. And then when you beat him, he disappears in a flash of light, and then it cuts to credits. That screwed with me. What? I like, that would mess a kid up. <laughs> yeah. I guess that, right? that's like it's a like, mother scene. Me. It's just, what? Oh, uh, yeah. Goodness. Goodness gracious. So, yeah, Pokemon <laughs> is the best game of all time. And The Witcher is the worst game, and Echo the Dolphin is also the best game of all time. Sound good? Yeah, uh, that sounds. Yeah. I'm willing to accept. Ooh. I'm willing to accept that that Echo is a seven on the scale of. Yeah, Echo of... the Dolphin is the best seven out of ten game ever. There we go. <laughs> there we go. I and Welcome we to the it. Machine is the best level of all time. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, this is fun. <laughs> this is fun. I know. I yeah. I wish that like we could just keep going. <laughs> a, yeah, a, a lot so of people wish now. that, but I'm here to here to ring the gong, Aww. and and get the shepherd's crook and, and take you all away. <sighs> I'm sorry to say. I figured it would be okay. happening sometime. Thank yeah. you. This is really fun. Yeah, yeah, thank you all for fun. coming. This has been fantastic. Uh, I've learned a lot. It's been. It's just great. I wish we could talk for a few more hours. I know I'm not the only one. <laughs> uh, cool. But but fortunately, we're not just going dark. We have a special musical performance for everybody. We are going to turn the stream over to Svetlana from Brazil, who has been providing a lot of the music that we've been performing during intermissions. And she will give us a short demonstration on music composition. And then... We will have a performance of a lot of her pieces to round out the hour. Uh, and that cool. will c conclude our broadcast Aww. for tonight, everybody. So look forward to that. Dead. That's funny. Yep. We will take just a few minutes more and uh, or give us just a few minutes to get that hand over done and cool. then enjoy the music. Thank you. Sounds good. Woo. I like to say cool. I'm really happy to have hung out with such really, with really, really smart people who I've oh. kind of respected on Twitter for a long time. And oh. Thank you. Feel in really good company. <laughs> oh. Thanks so much for coming along, John. I know I'm. I'm all. Oh, I'm so. I'm so glad that there's no webcams involved right now because I've just yeah, been like nice. jittering the entire time. Like <laughs> <laughs> I had to do some <sighs> quietly all pacing right. around my room, uh -huh. like with a headset on. All right. All right. Sure. Yeah, I think, Three, I think we're all on two, so, oh, one. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.